Hello, I'm Lux, and I think this show got most of its pacing right at the end of the season. And I'm Ember, though I would say more the late middle. And this is our thoughts on She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, Season 1, Episodes 11 through 13. Okay, the pacing from like 8 to 11 was pretty good. Those were very satisfying episodes. The last two, after, you know, 12 and 13, they suffered a little bit from that pacing again, especially 13. Oh, big time on 13. We did not have nearly enough time to actualize that the heroes might lose. I mean, that whole thing where Catra's going, no, now it's over. Great time to end the episode right there. Give us a chance to dwell on how badly the rebellion is off at this exact moment. Instead, we get about 30 seconds, and then Natasha and Spinarella show up, and then the rest of the princesses show up, and then Magical MacGuffin, and we win. I also like, it's in the name, Net Tossa. <laughs> Net? I toss Net! <laughs> also, there seems to be something going on between Net Tossa and... Spinnerella. Spinnerella, yeah. Well, they were always depicted as very close. Apparently a lot closer in this episode. That's kind of cool. Oh, that's actually about as close as they were when we first saw them. Though I do find it kind of interesting that they didn't bother to introduce them fully until the final episode. Well, they never got sent out on missions. They were just on the council. Also, Natasha or Natasha? <laughs> um... Seems to be a non-elemental princess, but Spinarella seems to be an elemental princess. Because wind is an element. So she seems more likely to be an elemental princess. We'd have to go back to episode 12 and pause where Light Hope is showing the shimmery outlines of all the elemental princesses to um, come up with the full tally and make sure that her silhouette is there. And it just hit me. They still don't know that... Entrapped is alive. alive. Wow. That's interesting. Especially the stuff they're setting up for next season. And I, I like Entrapped there at the end. It was a huge success. I know so much more now. Because it was a huge success in terms of gathering knowledge and finding out what can be done. And they still have the Black Garnet. You know, they could try to pull this exact same thing off again. Wouldn't be as successful, but the Whispering Woods is already in ruins. Get your strike force in place, and then pull the plug on the other princess's runestones right before you attack. Also, the, you know, the setup for this was pretty good. The stuff between Catra and Adora was pretty good. That was really the best part of episode 11, was the clever way of giving flashbacks. And it really was helping Katra's perspective. She's having a lot of younger sibling um, syndrome right there because Adora was always in the lead, always stepping in, always protecting her. But combine that with her more recent knowledge that Adora was always preferred and that with Adora not in the fright zone that she's able to advance, she's looking back at that protectiveness as being something that's holding her back, not... I'm doing this because I care about you, and I'm doing this because I don't want you to get better. Because Katri even says, heroes always need a sidekick. So she's internalizing those childhood memories in a different way. And she's always been hurt that she was coming in second best to Adora. Always. But with Adora gone, then there's nobody within the cadets that she has to compete with. And magnificent setup on getting rid of Shadow Weaver. Yes, I know Shadow Weaver's not gone gone, but Catra's going to have to fail a lot before Shadow Weaver's going to be let out of prison. I also think Shadow Weaver will get out in a different way, because we have definitely haven't seen the last of her. Oh, definitely not. But we don't know what she's capable of as an ordinary sorceress, because we've seen her repeatedly go back to the Black Garnet for recharging. So what... Did she lose when she stopped being Light Spinner? And what is she still capable of without the Black Garnet? Also, what 
happened to her face. Yeah, I wonder if that was during the battle where she got cast out of Mysticor? Possible. Or did she always look like that? Mm, I don't think so, especially going back to the statue and how the statue was set up. Mm-hmm, I'm just saying. It's a good thing to hypothesize. I just really enjoyed this latter half of the um, series. Just those first initial episodes, the pilot was okay, but after that the pacing was just terrible. Well, the pilot was rushed too, just not as badly as the subsequent episodes, but like we said, they were in a hurry for us to get somewhere. They were like, yeah, you need to know this stuff, but what we really want to show you is over here. Which seems to be those episodes 8 through like 11 or so. Where we're really getting the setup for the air quotes final conflict. I'm sorry, Catra is still a way more interesting character than Adora. She's also more consistently written. And interesting take on She-Ra, she's basically the planet's antivirus. Yeah, like a something that keeps things in balance, and apparently Light Hope is an artificial intelligence. Though I do remember her saying she was lonely or something. So that's interesting. Well, consider first one tech and, you know, the rune stones and how they've permeated the entire planet. Who says that the AI couldn't be that advanced? Considering they've terraformed that planet, makes you wonder which species are native and which species aren't. I'm guessing like all the humanoid species, as in anything that looks pure human, are first one descendants. Everyone else is a native. So like the um, inhabitants of the village of Thamor are natives? And Catra is, is probably native, and so is... Um, Scorpina, but Scorpina is a princess. So if elemental princesses are tied to runestones, you would think they would have some first one blood. Hmm. But yeah, it's a theory that needs more looking into. It's just interesting, especially since like it's an entire planet all the way down to like the core, I think. That seems to be a popular thing nowadays. And also, how could everything be that much back in balance with only that number of elemental princesses? We know there are way more princesses than that, both elemental and otherwise. And the Black Garnet right now isn't attached to anyone, so technically the Black Garnet can be neutral, because it's not attached to anyone. But that also leaves a hole in the network, because you don't have all the runestones actively attached to a princess. Also interesting that the Sword of Protection is a portable runestone. Another interesting thing is how um, Bo's heart lit up. Yes, in the power-up, because you'll notice that Seahawk didn't light up at all. All of the princesses went full-on glow, but Bo lit up, but only his heart. Just kind of appropriate. Also, that heart changed shape a couple of times throughout the episode. Like, when we initially saw it in this new armor set, it's square. More square. Yeah, and then we get a close-up of it when the glow happens, and it's more rounded, so it's more of an actual heart shape. So I was like, that's interesting. Middle off model there. I have a thing someone said, draw a heart. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Also, I still want to go back overall to sword safety. The sword of protection is not designed for throwing. Seems to work okay, though. But the balance is not right for throwing. That is a hacking and slashing sword type. Trust me, look up throwing knives sometimes. They have nothing in common with the sword of protection other than being sharp. Speaking of weapons, I actually like Natasha's. Nets. They were kind of cool. I'll ask you how she created one out of thin air there and used it as kind of a shield and then pulled all the energy balls and tossed it back. That was fun. Also, I like how all the princesses were able to play off each other's abilities because Perfuma threw some leaves in the air and then Frosta froze them and used them as projectiles. Though going into the fights, I noticed like a little, it's not really stuttering, but it's points where you're like, why isn't the hero reacting? Like, for instance, when Shira first ripped open that tank and she saw the explosive device and realized it was an explosive device. There was plenty of time for her to jump back. Yeah, and then there's that next scene where a bunch of these vehicles rush past her. Okay, yeah, she's not the target, but they're speeding right past her. You take your sword, you hold it out to the side, and suddenly you've sliced into them, which we saw you doing during the attack. So why not do that? Or you do that whole thing you did at the beginning where you swiped it across the water and blasted them all back. Because if they're not coming to attack you, they're going behind you to attack the thing you're trying to protect. So... Why are you watching them run past? Attack them! Yeah. At least hit one or two of them or send up a signal flare or something. 
And we're focusing mainly on the finale because that was, you know, the big piece. But to work our way backwards a little bit, I'm still not entirely sure about Swift when talking. I'm not entirely digging the personality yet. Also interesting that apparently the transformation also confers sentience. So are we going to have that lizard that she hit show up later? And since she is an antivirus, what is the purpose of the transformative ability? Has every She-Ra transformed a creature and bound it to her service? Because Swift Wind says he's able to sense Adora, which means there's a connection. So what is the purpose of the sword creating such a connection? And then there's the previous She-Ra, which was Mara, which we got a little bit more information on. That she was basically a failed She-Ra. So she was the first one to fail, but why did her failure lead to a thousand years with no She-Ra? Was it because the sword was lost? With Light Hope's sensor capabilities and all of those killer spider robots, I would think they could retrieve the sword. Furthermore, what's the qualifications for a She-Ra? Because we only ever see the transformed She-Ra's of history. We don't know what the humanoid base forms look like. Do they all have to be blondes? Was She-Ra blonde in every iteration? Because I did notice the design was slightly different on the previous She-Ra in that flashback that we got from Light Hope. Well, think about Miraculous Ladybug. Multiple ladybugs over generations. They weren't all the same. They were using the same abilities, but they're different people serving a function. And they did a nice job on the info dumps, the way they did to handle the flashbacks and the way they handled Light Hope explaining things. The fun of human interaction with voice activated AI. I felt like she was talking to my phone. <laughs> Except the AIs didn't interact like how our phones do. We're like, I don't know what this is. So here's a web search for you. I'm like, that's not what I asked for. That's not even remotely what I asked for. I asked for bacon and cheese and you gave me bagels with ice cream. I don't get it. I also noticed that the animation at certain points was like, I would almost say a little clumsy, especially in the fight scenes. Like she animations would like stop a couple of frames short than I would think they would. Or she was left in an awkward pose and I'm like, and then suddenly she's in a non-awkward pose. Also the mysterious disappearing and reappearing sword. Yeah, because there's several times where she tosses the sword aside. And then in the next episode or the next scene, the sword's on her back. And we're like, but she dropped it over there. Or she threw it over there. Not to mention the times when it's been pointed out, you know, like in Mysticore, that she carries the sword everywhere because she even brought it into the hot springs. So why would she be outside Bright Moon standing, looking over at, you know, the encroaching darkness and not have the sword on her back? Other than the fact that it would have made the hug that followed really awkward because once again sword safety could we at least get a sheath for that thing and then there was an and then there was a scene during the fight where shira cuts off that door lifts up the door with both hands tosses it and suddenly the sword's back in her hand then like she cut it off the sword was still clearly in her hand she took both hands and lifted up the door you don't see the sword she tosses the door and then you see the sword so either this sword can disappear and come back. Why didn't she do that when she lost it, if that's true? Because if that's the case, you should be able to recall it. Just little bits of inconsistency. It's almost like not just the fact that the pacing feels rushed, but it almost feels like they were rushed to get this out. Like they needed to hit a deadline that came up way too quick for them to get this out. Because there's a lot of QC they could have done. It's kind of like the original Sailor Moon Crystal broadcast versus the DVD release. They were in a hurry, but they cleaned things up for the release. Because mm -hmm, there are a lot of shots of Sailor Moon and the other Sailor Scouts looking way off model in the streaming broadcast. And then on the DVD releases, you're like, whoa. Like there's great scene I've seen where they were comparing a broadcast versus the, D versus the Blu-ray release of this one show where... In the streaming release, basically it looks like a bunch of stick figures fighting. And in the Blu-ray, you're like, wow, people. So that's what that's supposed to look like. And I'm perfectly okay with that because it gives me a reason to buy the Blu-rays and DVDs, but... Provided that they actually clean it up. Because, you know, there are some things where 
there was a rush and it never gets fixed, like the live action Avatar. They do how much bending to get how little effect? Yeah, apparently the budget for that got kind of cut short for some reason. I can't remember. I actually watched this video on all the reasons why the production of that movie failed. Also found out that even though the original creators were involved in it, they weren't actually questioned that much. And it sounds like they weren't really worked with that well when they were involved in the production of it. Well, if you watch the movie, I think that much is obvious. So that makes me really interested about what's going on with Netflix right now and the live action adaption of the series as a series, which is kind of interesting. Well, it kind of smacks of Disney. Disney keeps going back to his, its catalog and reusing. Way back when, they used their catalog to do a bunch of low production direct-to-video sequels using their assets. Now they're going back and redoing all their classic movies as live action. Or semi-live action, like the Lion King movie. Yeah, well, hard to do that in true live action. It's more like the most recent iteration of the Jungle Book, except without a token human. Who they would have to blue screen. This is all done on the computer. There might be some uh, film background shots, but I have a feeling it's mostly done on the computer. Yeah, but, you know, they're doing it a lot. Maleficent, Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast... Aladdin, The Lion King. That brings me back to speaking of CG. They did a pretty good job of blending the CG elements that they used in this series for certain things that were hard to animate or they wanted to not have to reanimate them a lot, like the boats, ships, tanks. It's much easier to have those guys as models in the computer instead of having to rehand draw all those lines all the time. Saves on production time, makes the particular animation like that more consistent. But you can barely notice that there are CG elements until certain things interact, interact with them in certain ways. And you're like, aha. Ah, now it stands out. Yeah, overall, I'm really enjoying the villain team more than the hero team. They're much more interesting. I'm a little disappointed in aspects of Scorpina's character because it seems like they're playing her as dumb a lot because she's a bit spacey and forgetful but she made force captain she has to have some abilities other than i punch hard and speaking of characters we like i'm still liking the ice princess something about her attitude i'm like i like her attitude i also like the water princess mermista mermista Especially in this episode, when they're coming in to the rescue, and Seahawk's like, Adventure! Splash! No. <laughs> You're not setting the boat on fire. We just got here. And he's like, sorry. He's like, got a little excited. <laughs> I still like how the fact that they do set a boat on fire. That is his thing, apparently. Him and Glimmer together, because she could wink him out of there. Awesome use of Glimmer's winking power once she got it back. Speaking of which, I was a little bit disappointed in the way they got rid of that. I know it was after she was kind of fully powered up and she's healed the crystal and everything, but still, it's like, I wanted, like, more? She, in the scheme of things, hadn't been dealing with the issue for very long. And I think it almost would have been more meaningful if she completed the battle without her magic. And they had to, like, heal her later or after the battles when she figures out, this is how I heal. Bonk! Oh, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, very Avatar and Luke Skywalker and basically every guru training sequence ever of running off before you've completed your training because your friends need help. But I think at least Adora will have a chance to go back to the Crystal Palace and engage in training with Light Hope, which I hope she does in small sessions. Also, without taking anyone with her, because I am tired of the system's defenses being triggered. Also, why weren't they triggered just by Catra being in there? Why wasn't it until Catra actually snagged the crystal that they went off? Because based on previous experience, yeah, it seems like it should have gone off sooner. Just a little. And going back to those flashbacks, I really liked how they transitioned between the flashback and reality. And they did it in such a way that I actually that I was actually questioning at the end if that was actually Catra, where. 
she's cutting off and dropping Adora. Yeah. It's like is that is that really Catra? Because it could be the the flashback or the system going let go. It could be the system using the information to push Adora into letting go. It could also be the system playing on Adora's fears of the gulf between her and Catra. Because not very long ago, they were still grabbing each other to keep each other from falling. But, you know, Catra really had a moment of realization in episode 11 when the spider was carrying her off. Because at first, she screams for Adora. She's struggling. And then she's like, wait a minute, I can fight. And she gets herself free and she starts attacking and she's winning. And then Adora comes in and deals the killing blow. Not that you shouldn't look out for your friends, but it wasn't needed. And so it just really rubbed Catra's fur the wrong way. Because she really did have it. And I'm beginning to question the metal quality in this world. Because a lot of things are punching right through it. Yeah. And we've seen... Those same punches not kill a humanoid. Or um, when Glimmer jumps off of things with the new staff she got that was apparently her father's and she stabs into stuff, I'm like, yeah, okay. I can understand the arrows because they're special, but this is getting ridiculous. Well, I'm pretty sure the staff itself has magical properties because it bears a strong resemblance to Glimmer's staff from the 80s show, also, even though she looks nothing like the 80s Glimmer. Also, apparently it channeled some of the bad energy that was in her which could have actually been the start of the healing the staff was pulling it out of her and using it i would have much rather have seen that over time that the staff could purify over time that would have been a cool ability or it just gave like a lightning rod a outlet for the energy to leave her body because glimmer's staff if you recall from when we read that one where Glimmer was trapped and had used up all the stored energy and her staff is powered by light. Another thing in the final episode that um, I was thinking about is the whole connection between the queen and the crystal when it's supposed to be the princesses that have a connection. I know Glimmer still has a connection to it because she can heal or recharge from it, but she doesn't seem to be as connected to it as her mom. But... If you're the princess daughter of an immortal, when's the opportunity for the runestone to pass on? Also interesting because it seems that she charges from the moonstone because when we first see her come back, her mother takes her straight up to the moonstone. But when we see Glimmer come back after she's glitching and she's laying down to recharge, it doesn't look like she's anywhere near the moonstone. So was that more like, okay, we did the recharge off screen and now I'm laying down pretending to rest? Because normally, based on what we saw from her previous Moonstone charge, once she's recharged, she feels fine. And where she was laying down to recharge, you know, that we saw didn't appear to be next to the Moonstone, was definitely not her room because we know her bed's way up high. Which was kind of a point that was pointed out after she got mm -hmm. cursed. Why did I have to? Who puts a bed that high? <laughs> Someone who can teleport. Or can jump really, really high, like Katra. Also, that's kind of a contrast I saw between Shira slash Adora and Katra. When Adora's Shira, she's very brute strength, punch things hard. But when she's Adora, she's a little bit more flexible, though she's like throughout this series, she's, in my opinion, has been getting a little bit stronger as Adora. Because at the beginning, it didn't feel like she was that much stronger than people, but Near the end, she was, as Adora, was lifting things. I was like, that's like Shira level. Yeah, so it's like, over time, does the bonding with the runestone go deep enough that, you know, eventually, is there no Adora and she's Shira all the time? Hmm. It could also just be inconsistent writing still. <laughs> like, someone misread, like, this is Adora's strength and this is Shira's strength. Oh, that's, they're both the same person, so it must be the same. I'll just go with Shira's strength. I really hope they get whatever production issues that caused the rushness of these episodes worked out for the second season. Because first seasons have a tendency to be a little rough in a lot of series because they're still trying to feel where they want to take it. They have a good idea of where they want to go, but they're forcing it into that instead of letting it grow into that. But at the same time, 
you know, you're supposed to be common held anime theory is you should be able to completely judge a show within just a couple of episodes. Some people have that mastered down to one episode. Go look at Steins Gate. Because it's hard to justify additional episodes if you have a weak opening. It's like, with all the variety out there, you need to impress at the opening. But I liked this first season enough to give a second season a shot. Because especially those, those really good episodes in this, when they had the pacing working for them and the story flowed right, if they can just take that and expand it out to the rest of the episodes for whatever they're planning on doing for the next season, that would be a good series. Well, in the next season, Brightman's going to be trying to repair the Whispering Woods, and the Fright Zone is going to be trying to attack before then. We're also going to be sending the princesses further out to get the rest of them in the Alliance, because especially now that Frosta is part, because that was Adora's whole theory, if we get Frosta, we'll get everyone else. Well, now they have Frosta, so where's everybody else? Because mm -hmm, it sounds like there's way more princesses than the one we, than the section we've seen. Especially since on Entrapta's model, there were a lot of nodes on there. There were a ton of nodes on Entrapta's model. Also, just look at the number of people who were at the princess ball. Every princess gets a plus one. Assume every princess brought one person which we already know is not true because Adora and Glimmer came together, which means two plus ones are automatically eliminated. But assume, because you can't have more than one plus one. So automatically, half of those attending are princesses. Mm. And that was a pretty big shindig. Definitely something to look into. Any other points you'd like to bring up? Well, I already did the lizard and swift wind and she and training and pacing and I'm wondering when they're gonna let the Rebellion know that Entrapped is still alive and playing for the other team. Because apparently Catra doesn't think that it's an advantage to let them know at this point. And it's definitely not an advantage to give Entrapta enough time to think about the fact that they're actually attacking her former friends and the princesses and that her own kingdom will be under attack. Yeah, I don't think she actually knew any of that during the whole... Thing. Even though a lot of it was said in front of her, because when Catra was talking to Lord Hordak after they lost, they were still talking about, I got further to taking Bright Moon than anyone ever has. The Whispering Woods are still destroyed. Etheria is ours for the taking. And Entrapta was right there in the background. Interesting. So I think right now Entrapta's a lot involved in. I have more access to this than ever! Give me more, give me more, give me more! Yes, and all of the things that she's learning. But that's one of the things, is right now she's not calculating the cost. It's knowledge for the pursuit of knowledge. The scientists who come up with all this amazing stuff, and it never occurs to them that there are darker applications. It's just straight pursuit of science. And there are how many movies of that? Or there's those scientists who create something and all they ever see is the good it can create. They never see the bad that could come of it. Oh, well, let's just go into the past. How about Ben 10? When Ben got the watch, he used it as a weapon. The creator of the watch intended it to facilitate communication and understanding between species. It was never intended as a weapon. Hmm, interesting. I did not know that because I only ever watched certain episodes of that series. Yeah, I I wasn't a devotee either, but I happened to catch the correct episode to get that piece of information. Ah, the only series I really watched consistently from that from that set of creators was Generator Rex. So remember that particular show didn't really get much traction because there was lots of potential. Yeah, oh, but back to Shira, and hmm, anything else actually? Because <laughs> I think I've covered my points I wanted to go over. Well, let's touch on the huge thing in the finale that Queen Angela is now welcoming of She-Ra and Adora both. You don't get a group hug like that if the Queen still has reservations about you. Also, you don't get the Queen ordering her only daughter to go bring you back to Bright Moon. I do like how that hug happened at the end. It's like hugging and then motion and she's like, uh, me and 
bow in the back is like <gasps> and shoves her right into it and then Swiftwind jumps in and wow the queen has a nice wingspan because that covered all of them so that brings me back to when she was being um attacked and eventually collapsed by the blast i wish she would have taken more time or at least sounded more weak during the whole recovery portion where glimmer got healed like it would have been nice to have her show a little even though you know she's getting power from the stone and everything to show a little bit more weakness there because she did take that blast because the blast went th right through her shield and ko'd her so it's just the magical MacGuffin was a little too magical because you know shiver was all beat up too i mean those claw marks across her back multiple hits you know from the explosion and multiple scratches multiple hits not to mention all the damage from those electrified whips lashings ropes whatever you want to call them and i noticed like the more the um princesses were in harmony the stronger she was glow was so i think she was getting a lot of feedback from that because she was job is to keep the rune stones and the princesses in harmony so it would make sense that that would have an effect on Shira because I figured the overall weakening of the rune stones was part of why she was so grayed out during the first part of the battle because we get several shots of her vision blurring out and having trouble moving and I also like the fact that the rainbow wasn't a purifying thing it was an instant turn the bad guy to good rainbow it was just a laser blast multi-hue laser blast magical MacGuffin check <laughs> actually now that I think about it, it's more of a force blast, like a big force, because the laser is kind of a focus. Yeah, this was more widespread. So, think we covered everything? Well, at least everything we could think of. <laughs> everything that we could think of right now. I don't think we want to hit the pause button while we go, what did we miss? So, let's wrap it up with the outro. And this has been our thoughts on Shira and the Princesses of Power, Season 1. Episodes 11 through 13. Hey, not only the end of the episode, but the end of the series, at least for now, because who knows when they'll put season two up. So, yay, we finished something. When does that ever happen? I hear you guys asking, because there are several series that have more episodes out that we haven't covered. It's called MLP Wasn't on Hiatus Yet. So, usual YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, check out other videos. We have playlists. You, you don't have to think much. You can just click on a playlist and it'll just keep playing for however long the playlist is. Some of those are very long, so choose wisely. And when you're ready to leave YouTube, we have tons of links for that. Lux's art in multiple locations, DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Mastodon. Uh, Patreon, coffee. I have a small Tumblr thing. Very small. No art. Y you guys should know by now I don't draw. You guys have never seen me draw. And you probably never will. Oh, and Zazzle. And you guys know how all that stuff works. I shouldn't have to tell you every time. You're internet savvy people. I, I would expect that you are aware of all these things. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive and the form of views, likes, comments, dialogue, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.